What's up, friendly neighborhood nerds? This is Judah Rad, and I'm here with Boom Robo Strange. Our guest today has had an extensive career writing for Marvel, where he created the third Power Man, uh, Victor Alvarez. Also, uh, has written for Valiant, um, quite a bit for Valiant, and then uh, various independent publishers, including Evil Twin Comics, which he formed with Ryan Dunlavey. Um, he's also a playwright, which we're going to get into that uh, a little in a little more depth later. Um, it's my privilege to welcome Fred Van Lante. How are you doing, Fred? Doing good. Thanks for having me on, guys. All right. So let's just jump right into it. Um, so boom, boom, just going in. Uh, no transition. So uh, when uh, <laughs> when you came on for Archer and Armstrong, most of the titles at that time were like they were pretty serious, gritty, right? The whole dark superhero deal. But then you have Archer and Armstrong. Uh, right. So did did edit, the editorial kind of like seek you out for that or did you seek out Archer and Armstrong how did that work they did uh well the the story I like to tell is that I I didn't realize I I was sort of being groomed for doing Archer and Armstrong because originally I had done something at Marvel called Incredible Hercules with Greg Pak mm. and Tom Brevoort uh, who's been a long time editor over there at Marvel told me that when they were talking about books to spin off from World War Hulk which was this tie-in event that Incredible Hercules spun off of somebody decided, well, let's do a, a Hercules Amadeus Cho team up uh, book. And they thought sort of teen genius and Greg Pak, who was writing Hulk at the time, had created uh, Amadeus. And uh, they, at first they were in the room, they're kind of like, well, we don't know if that's going to work. But then Tom said, well, it'd be like Archer and Armstrong, right? So you have this big, strong guy and this, and this, with this younger kid following him around. Not quite the same thing because uh, I guess Armstrong is. Uh, kind of uh uh you know uh, drinks too much and, and yeah. you know loves loves <laughs> the ladies he's a, a maniac too much. yeah he's, he's a bon vivant like hercules uh amadeus cho i and archer i don't think i have a whole lot in common but uh but yeah I, and what's funny is that when hunter gorenson from valiant came up to me at new york comic con i asked me archer armstrong i said sure you know i'll check it out and i had to go home and google it because i had no idea what archer armstrong <laughs> was and it wasn't until my valiant archer armstrong came out that I happen to be in the Marvel offices, and Tom told me that story. Nice, nice. That's awesome. I, I've read, I've read that whole Archer and Armstrong run, and I, I read the Delinquents, and I really, really liked Ivar as well. Like, um, thank you. Everything, everything you've done from Valiant, super cool. My favorite is definitely uh, the Delinquents because that was just like super. Ex I'm just a sucker for crossovers. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah, that's just being a comic book fan. That's like. That's what well, it's that, all about. Yeah, and that was a sort of a classic crossover, right? Because I worked on that with James Asmus, who was writing the Quantum Woody book at the time. So the same mm -hmm. creative team in Kano is just a genius. So he's just the art. He just knocked it right out of the park. And hundred percent, perfectly suits we, the uh, book. We were we sort of plod the whole thing in a really long Skype call before that was a thing <laughs> <laughs> that everyone had to do, uh, and we were just laughing our asses off so much. My wife had to come and go. What are you guys doing? <laughs> like, what are you talking <laughs> about? Because James started out as a playwright, so Crystal actually knew him long before he ever got in the comics uh, through the playwriting scene. And so uh, that was sort of an interesting sort of convergence there. Hmm. Uh, and so we were coming up with like, yeah, it's like a pirate map, except it's tattooed on the guy's ass. And <laughs> it's, all, it's all hobo. It's all hobo or it's all hobo conspiracies, you know. So I want to ask about the hobos. Uh, so the hobo culture stuff in the delinquents got me on like, uh, I guess what you would call a Google spiral. Sure. Um, it's a and, lot out uh, there. Yeah, just a, a rabbit hole because it, it was a piece of American mythology I really wasn't aware of. Uh, did you, how did you, is that something you already kind of knew about and just wanted to put in a book? Or did you like have to do a lot of research for that? How did that work out? I couldn't tell you off the top of my head how we gravitated towards hobos specifically. <laughs> but uh, in the 80s, Kitchen Sink published this miniseries by James Vance and Dan and Ambar, I think the name of the artist, was called Kings in Disguise. It was an adaptation of a play by Vance um, about... Uh, the depression and about this kid running away from home and ending up with this guy who claimed he was the king of France and they, they became hobos and it was set during the early thirties. And I mean, you know, it, 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 it's not hugely, in, I don't think it's a comic people talk about right now, but it was very influential. It's time uh, a couple years ago when Norton reprinted it, uh, Alan Moore wrote the introductions and he thought it was wow. very uh, influential. So, and so in the comic, they, they reproduced a lot of these like symbols that you see 
in the delinquents. Uh, and so I definitely kind of had that in my back pocket. Weirdly, Crystal, my wife, had been doing a, a play that uh, drew a lot from Little Orphan Andy. Mm. And so she ended up doing a lot of like hobo stuff with like, because a lot of Little Orphan Annie and the musical Annie come out of that Great Depression culture. So I sort of already knew about all this weird hobo stuff. I, I you know, I just couldn't tell you why we ended up landing on that for Archer and Armstrong and Quantum and Woody. I knew that one of the first ideas was that we wanted to go against uh, what some of the assumptions would be and, and have Armstrong really bond with Quantum and who's the more kind of uptight of the duo. Right. And Woody, who's like the, the the party animal of the brothers, partner up with the corrupting the, archer with the super <laughs> anal archer. We definitely wanted to do to flip that. Um, and I think James knew a lot. I think we also ended up talking about like weird tourist attractions and how we wanted that to be part of it. So yeah, it was it was it was definitely one of those things that once we got going, it became super obvious the way to go. Awesome. So cool. Ivar. So Ivar, I think personally wins like best award for uh, most different, uh, definitely most ambitious uh, Valiant title. Um, it also felt like the story was a bit personal. Uh, how did you come up? How'd you come up with this idea? Well, when I was time traveling, <laughs> found myself in Viking times, and no, uh, yeah, you know, I it, it was an idea. I, it's one of those things where a lot of times, like. Um, uh, when you're writing like the stuff that you come up with a scene and you come up with a um or the image and you end up saying okay what what how what leads us to this point what other things sort of come out from that and and very early on Ivar is introduced in Archer and Armstrong although in kind of a really kind of strange way once we realized we, we you know we wanted to bring him back as well as in his own series uh for whatever reason that the first image that came to me was that first scene of Neela in CERN in Switzerland being about ready to invite, invite invent time travel and she has a knock on a door and there's a time travel saying don't do that <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a bad awesome. idea don't do that uh and uh, and so the whole thing kind of sprung up from there and, and I'd read the original like Ivar Time Walker series which I mean I yeah I don't like the trash of the Christ but it's just not very good uh and uh <laughs> but there I did take a lot of ideas like in that series there are these Promethean type gold Gollum characters that are fighting Ivar and there's a there's a mysterious kind of evil woman from the future who's pursuing him and you don't really understand why but that's basically all I took from it um, it's so character driven like yeah it's it's the it's the interactions between Ivar uh Art Armstrong and uh Galad the right favorite, uh, favorite parts of the story <laughs> Yeah, we we were working uh, before Valiant's recent sort of turnaround. We were working on a, on a series that was just going to be the three of them, uh, like an Abordo Brothers series, and that would have been fun. But sadly, nice. did not get the green light. Is not okay. Yeah. Maybe someday. Um, would you ever, before I get some? Well, two things. So as an aside, we had Magdalene Bizaggio on our on our show uh, a while ago. Uh, she wrote uh, Dr. Mirage. And one of the things she told us when we asked her uh, what her favorite uh, Valiant title was is she said Ivar. So she's been very cool about that. Yeah, she told this to me on Twitter. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, I Ivar is in the top three things that I have of my personal favorites. So uh, I, awesome. I, it's just neat. And, it, you know, insanely, it was, it was originally planned for four uh, issues. And it was to Dinesh's credit that he was like, no, this is this. He was right. You know, he's like, this feels, feels like 12. So. We got to do exactly what we wanted from beginning, middle, and end. Oh yeah, it's awesome. So you and uh, and I, when I wrote this question, I didn't realize that Crystal was your wife. Uh, yeah, but you and Crystal uh, wrote this play about Jack Kirby titled King Kirby. Um, I was able to hear uh, most of it on Spotify. Um, but it's really good. It's really interesting. Thank you. Um, the performances are really good too. But um, thanks. So yeah, it's the original New York cast. Yeah, it's it it's good. I wish I could see it live. Um, I don't know if I think there's only was there only one one performance or uh... there have been a bunch. It was here in New York. It was in Calgary. It was in Seattle. It's been in okay. D.C. It has been in I'm mis forgetting one North Carolina somewhere. They're talking about doing it in Chicago. Uh, but really, you know, as the playwright, you just sort of write the piece and then. Um, 
you know, other producers in theaters. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a whole, I mean, unless I produce it myself, which I did for the inaugural production. Mm -hmm. uh, It's just kind of up to other theaters. And, you know, as you might imagine, due to this pandemic, you may have heard of, um, there's a lot of backlog, like, you know, the theater season Mm -hmm. was completely scrapped for most of 20, we're all 2020 really in most of 2021. So yeah, we'll see. Uh, uh, I definitely have my fingers crossed for Chicago because that's obviously a huge um, that'd be awesome. theater town. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd have to. I would have to make it over there. Um, so I have to ask, uh, where do you stand on Stanley? Because so we find a lot of people. We find that there's these different camps. We have these sure. incredibly, incredibly anti Lee Kirby Ditko fans, but then there's also people who completely like lionize Stanley and right. like. Personally, I love Stan Lee, but I also feel like Kirby, Ditko, and perhaps like Bill Everett, Joe Simon, and Carl Burgos deserve far more credit for sure. Marvel Comics than and they, they get. do. Yeah, yeah. What, what's your take on that? Well, I mean the 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 problem with Lee is that well, being someone who writes comic books professionally, you know the the, the bottom line is that what. Lee did. Lee did a couple things. I mean, the most the most important thing Lee did, I think, for Marvel was to have this editorial persona, this kind of self deprecating, very early, you know, perfect for the '60s sort of style of humor uh, that carried over from letter columns and the stand soapboxes and the dialogue and all that stuff. Um, but uh, you know, as in terms of like the quote unquote work that he did, you know, a lot of it was, in fact, particularly after those first couple years. A lot of it was simply assigning artists story ideas like, you know, in this issue, let's have Spider-Man fight, I don't know, Craven, you know, like let's bring Craven back. And so John Romita Sr. had to go out and figure out the story and draw it all the way out. And a lot of times, most of these guys would put margins in the, uh, do the dialogue in the margins, and then Lee would, based on that, write the dialogue. Um, except for the extent to which Lee was writing the dialogue, most of what his role was is what today we would call an editor. Mm. We wouldn't call mm. him a writer, okay. you know. Uh, in fact, Wally Wood, who took over Daredevil from Bill Everett, uh, was was so infuriated and insulted by the fact that Lee was, you know, directing all of his Daredevil issues and was, let us not forget, taking a page rate like he was taking a writing he was t- taking the full writing page rate from the artist who was doing a, a significant chunk of the writing uh i used to work for a pension fund this is called double dipping <laughs> it's generally mm-hmm. frowned upon mm-hmm. uh so what would quit you know and so and and ditko quit very quickly because he was fed up with it. it took kirby about eight years but then he finally quit once he he found a, a softer landing spot at um dc at dc yeah so you know I'm not one of these people, like, I, I get into arguments sometimes. I'm a huge Kirby fan, and I don't apologize for it, but I do get into fights with fellow Kirby fans who, you know, won't accept anything less than digging up Lee's corpse and beating it with sticks, you mm. know? Like, that's, like, I'm not <laughs> right. that level of, like, insa- insanity about Lee. But I would just say, if you do love Stanley, I think you should be aware of what it is you're, you're a fan of him for. That's right. Um, if it's about creating, eh, I mean, there's no evidence Lee created a lot of, or, or perhaps any of this stuff. Um, most of the stuff that you associate with Marvel, uh, Iron Man's armor, the red and gold, the Hulk getting mad, or Bruce Banner becoming the Hulk when he became mad, those were with Steve Ditko ideas, particularly mm-hmm. the Hulk getting, Banner becoming Hulk when he get mad. If you read the Hulk when Lee and Kirby were doing it, you know, it, but the sunset, they couldn't make up their minds. It was when the sun set. It was when, you know, uh, he had a big gun, a big gamma gun. He zapped himself with a bag of gamma gun so he could turn into the Hulk at will. But it was Ditko really found the, the heart of that strip. You know, and obviously Ditko came with all the Spider-Man stuff. Lee came with all the Fantastic Four stuff and the Thor stuff. Um, Kirby and Simon came up with Captain America on their own and Lee wasn't involved at all. 20 years before uh, that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So uh, again, I'm not like, I'm not a hater. I, 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 I'm a fan of the truth more than I'm a fan of either Jack Kirby <laughs> or Stan Lee. So I would say if you, if you, I, I don't have any problem with people loving Stan Lee. It just gets a little frustrating when, when people talk about sort of the, him as this, you know, and you know, I just did this book on animation uh, people talk the same way about Walt Disney, hmm. who didn't draw anything after about 1925, you know, once he got Oberworks to move to Kansas, from Kansas City to Hollywood to work with him. Hmm. 
Uh, you know, you never wrote a script. Walt Disney directed exactly one cartoon. It's called The Midas Touch. It's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> after, I should say, after uh, works came, came to work for him. And so it all comes down to, like, people, look, life is very complicated and stressful. And people like simple narratives. And that Walt Disney and Stan Lee were these creative dynamos that, that did everything. Steve Jobs, another great example of somebody who, that, yeah. Yeah, who, who takes credit for literally everything. And they don't even really have to lie, right? It's people, people project that onto them. You know a, I mean? It becomes like a mythology. Yeah, like, you just have I to have... not contradict people. That's right. <laughs> you just have to that's not right. contradict right. them, you know. And Stan Lee is very, you know, oh, but I always said Jack was great. Well, that's great, but you've never given him any money. Well, I'm not in charge of the company, but your cousin-in-law is. That's right. All right. That's you know? right. I feel like that's that's the uh, that's the answer we've been getting most, and I feel like it's because that's, good. that's the right answer. Right? Yeah, that's if, good. If, that's if good you look hear. at it from like a, an objective, like historian's perspective, of like it's not that I hate this person; it's that you don't love him for the reasons uh, that you think you do. You know. Well, thing. and if you right. read uh, my buddy Abraham Reisman uh, wrote a biography of Stanley called True Believer that came out earlier this year. I recommend it. I think it's great. I gave it a good review. Thirteenth Dimension. Uh, and it's hard to hate somebody whose life kind of devolved to the point that Stan Lee's did into elder abuse and yeah. just getting ripped off by every scam. I mean, it's really very sad being a comics guy and reading this because if you go to spend any amount of time at comic book conventions, you meet a hundred of these wannabe big shots. And just the fact that the most famous person you're meeting produced just got taken to the cleaners by these guys. It's just sad. Right. Like it's just sad. Right. Uh, and I had one of these people I was talking to, I had this review and we were, and it got, kind of blew up on Facebook and so I had a lot of haters, a lot of Fred haters coming at me. And I had one guy who I sort of knew who knew a lot of these people who would sort of sort of barnacle like cling to Stanley and like, well, and he was like, well Stan wanted it. Stan loved attention. Stan, you know, you know. Oh, so you're taking advantage of a of a of a desperate old man. And that's right. <laughs> and that's but he not wanted okay. me to take advantage of him. No, right. that's not a that's, No, that's yeah. not how it works. <laughs> you ever heard of cake and candy from a baby? Well the baby <laughs> the baby didn't stop me from taking his candy. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's sad. You know? no, you're right. It's really the that's baby's sad. fault when you get right down to it. Oh yeah. <laughs> well. Well, continue on with Marvel, but um, a little bit more levity. Uh, you created <laughs> uh Power Man. Uh the third Power Man, Victor Alvarez. Uh, where did you where did you get the idea for this character and like was there a reference is there anybody you knew to help the you kind of put that on um well it, like uh, again like incredible hercules it, the new power man spun out of a, an event book mm -hmm. which shadowland which was this daredevil and sort of street level event and marvel wanted a new power man the name wasn't really being used cuz luke cage went by luke cage these days mm -hmm. um Eric Jot, who was the other, the first Paraman was, uh, was one of the, the Thunderbolts, was right? Oh, okay. He was, he, well, he, well, he was started on the Avengers, uh, because he had stole Wonder Man's powers. And sorry, I can tell by your glazed expressions, you have no idea. My, my, my main, <laughs> my main head, <laughs> Atlas. Uh, he was, he, no. he was okay. Atlas in the Thunderbolts. That was the original Power Man. Anyway, okay. That doesn't really matter at all. Or why I thought <laughs> of that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so they, they, they called me up. I was on vacation to Hawaii. This is really glad. I was like, I had a really bad connection on my cell phone. I was like, what, huh? Uh, I don't often take glamorous vacations. This was like one of the few times, but like they wanted to like, uh, uh, they wanted to, their idea was so in immortal iron fist, iron fist had at the end of that series, iron fist had taken over a dojo in Manhattan and was training, um, younger kids, and they wanted they their their pitch to me was they wanted this twelve year old black kid who would run around and punch things, yelling, "I'm Power Man! I'm Power Man!" And they thought that was funny, and I was like, "Yes, no, I'm not doing that. Shut up." <laughs> me, Whitey McMyers, uh, Whiterson <laughs> is not doing that that dumb idea. So I said, like, Let, "Let's make him older. Let's give him a personality. Let's treat him like ah. a real character, not you know, uh, whatever it was they thought they were gonna do." Uh, I did get hired at the point a lot of times for my humor and knowledge of humor, but 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 I was in in sort of faculty of it. But 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 sometimes you're just like, I thought it was interesting to have an uh, an Afro Latinas character. Uh, there weren't a lot of those running around yeah. Marvel at the time. I thought that was that was interesting. So uh, 
I decided to make him Dominican. I for the sole reason I'm a big baseball fan. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> baseball, <awesome. laughs> baseball players uh-huh. are Dominican, so that's something I know a little. I know a little bit about the Dominican Republic solely because of my baseball obsession. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, and so I thought it'd be interesting to make him the uh, the son of an old Power Man villain and give him or Luke Cage villain. I should say back when Luke Cage was called Power Man, and sort of do that connection. Um. Then a year later, when Miles Morales came along, who was a oh, his character, who's who's the <laughs> uncle, who's the nephew of a, of a Spider-Man villain, I was like, nice Great. of course, thanks, of course, thanks. Thanks. nice idea. <laughs> thanks. Where'd you come up with that? Huh. Wow. Thanks, guys. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, but that's kind of how Marvel rolls. Uh, but it, he's a I, you know what really really locked it was Mahmoud Asrar designed him and drew the Power Man Iron Man series and he's just a genius like he kick, he's kicking ass on Conan and X Men so I don't need you to tell guy, tell you guys that yeah. but he just came up mm-hmm. with the idea was sort of like that the guy sort of absorbed the hero his powers he sort of absorbed, absorbed light force and so uh, like chi and so he a lot of that uh, and so the way Mahmoud uh, actualized that just really clicked into my head what this character was like and i was also hugely influenced i love those those early luke cage hero for hire comics are awesome yeah, i mean they they're really just are. terrific and i crammed as many of those crazy characters that billy graham and george tusca designed into that original miniseries as possible like mr fish and cockroach and cottonmouth and all those guys i was very gratified to see that shades who is uh power man's father did have the last name alvarez in the Luke Cage uh, Netflix show, which nice. is something, which which they were a little confused because Alvarez was Power Man's mother's name. Got it. Shades, Shades, I think has a different actual last name. Mm-hmm. So, so maybe we'll get Victor down the road. That's right. You know? That's right. So maybe Victor will yeah. show up eventually. <laughs> <laughs> even even though they got that little tiny bit wrong, how does that feel? Like that's like that's got to be pretty cool seeing your stuff on on the screen like that, huh? Well, it's always very cool, you know. Uh, when they did uh, Hulu's Modok, uh, or Hulu's Modok, when Hulu did Marvel's Modok, yeah. the showrunners <laughs> there were very cool. And I gotta, shall I show you my swag bag? Let's do do, it. Shall we do yes. an unboxing live on the air? Yes. I mean, oh, it's yes. not really an unboxing because I've already opened the box, but for you guys, it'll be new. Do it. Yes. One day we'll get swag boxes. One day. So this is very cool. They did not need to do this. So there it is. This is my aim swag box. With the man himself on the inside. This is all gonna fall out when I open this. Head, but anyway, it's somewhat jumbled. So wow, I have my uh, it's my aim stress ball. You know, when superheroes are surrounding my secret lair and it's really stressing me out. This will right. help. <laughs> awesome. I have my. AIM branded uh, coolant cup. I never use these. I don't know what they're supposed to be called, so I'll keep my, like, this is what the, the RNA strains I'll use to drink this to give myself extra superpowers when the That's superheroes right. bust in. <laughs> That's right what I on. use. And if it's, like, really warm DNA, which is, just don't think about that at all. We also have this Modoc like, cup cozy that I can stick in there. I got a Modoc. I got my AIM uh, badge to identify myself so I don't get accidentally vaporized. Very nice letter from Modoc. Welcome me to the AIM organization. And the the uh, the, the new manual, pamphlet. the new recruit yeah. pamphlet, which of course, because due to AIM, due to Modoc's organizational skills, is completely blank. Of course, of course. All right. So that was pretty cool, <laughs> and it was very cool to see like. Uh, uh, Monica and Carmilla, who appeared in the very first Marvel comic I ever did, appear in that show, mm. uh, and that was cool. And it was neat that they named the the elementary school in the show after me. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> that was pretty uh, awesome, and that was nice. And the the my favorite episode was I did a book called Modox Eleven, which is where Modox does this heist with a bunch of minor supervillains, and they did sort of a they did kind of an adaptation of that. Uh, I. The showrunner pointed out to me, uh, Jordan Blum, who's terrific and a huge comics fan, uh, he co-showrun the show with, with Pat and Oswald. Uh, he pointed out that the original Modox 11 cast were all Spider-Man villains, mostly, at least half, if not more. And so they're right, their TV rights are owned by Sony. So, uh, oh, nice. Well. Makes oh, well. sense. 
Um, but uh, that was cool. That was cool. So yeah, it's been sort of a banner year for. And since I did so much work with Taskmaster, I'll be curious to see if they use any of that in Black Widow. Though I've not been tipped mm -hmm. off to that one way or the other. I don't love the movie appearance so far, but I'm hoping I grow to love it. It's better than the Skeletor look. The thing that always drove me uh -huh. crazy about Taskmaster was that he's wearing a mask. His head is not literally an articulated <laughs> skull. Right. Which, other than George Perez, who created him, everyone else drew him, for the most like part, as if, he, mm -hmm. as if he's Skeletor. And so I was writing this video, this, this Avengers video game, and I, and I put Taskmaster in it because I have a tendency to put Taskmaster in everything because I love Taskmaster. Yeah. Taskmaster was in like one of the first comics I ever bought with my own money, which was a Marvel two, two, uh, team up where he fought Scott Lang, Ant Man, and Spider Man. And so the guys, they, they were, the video games were busting on me because like he looks just like Skeletor and they gave him a Skeletor voice. I'm like, he's not. And they, <laughs> and they designed him look just like, and I, and I said repeatedly in my notes, he doesn't, he's wearing, he has like, flesh and hair and eyes and a nose like everyone he, else he's wearing he's a funny. mask <laughs> he's 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 a funny he's like an a often funny character as that's well right. yes yeah. he definitely yeah. has a sense of humor and does not take himself terribly seriously so that's something we have in common right. and like me he has a face <laughs> <laughs> not right. a skull anyway uh yeah so so, so speaking of speaking of things that you've created um Evil Twin Comics. I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, what would you recommend from Evil Twin Comic? From Evil Twin Comics, just kind of tell us about it um, and how the idea came about and what sure. kind of stuff you offer. Uh, Evil Twin is the sort of generic uh, umbrella term. It, we used to publish Ryan Dunlavey and I, the cartoonist Ryan Dunlavey and I, did a comic called Action Philosophers. That's the lives and thoughts of history's ablest brain trust, told in a hip and humorous comic fashion. Uh, we got a Xeric grant way back in 2004 to self-publish it, which we did. Uh, and then we self-published the comic book history of comics. Um, but then um, Dark Horse picked up Action Philosophers and IDW picked up uh, the comic book history of comics. So we, we basically retired Evil Twin as an actual publishing company. It's still a legal entity that Ryan and I use to, uh, you know, as, as a as a fun, sorry, it's a front for uh, laundering drug money. No, no. All right. that, would be, that would be, that would be way more interesting than what we actually use it for, which yeah. is just, it just, it makes signing contracts easier. Uh, w one book we're really proud of is the companion to the comic book history of comics, which is called the comic book history of animation. Uh, IDW, we get, we had a Kickstarter to complete the book. IDW brought it as single issues and the trade paperback, uh, which I'm going to go get. Oh, nice. Hey, are you still going to ask about mission statement? So this lovely trade paperback right here. This this will you can, you can have your copy. Uh, I believe on July twenty. Full color. Ooh. Oh, this is the history of animation from Gertie the dinosaur to Spirited Away. It's CGI. Uh, Miyazaki, Disney, Hanna Barbera, Filmation, He Man, all your favorites. Nice, nice. awesome. So projects. You guys got that going on um what else is going on what's what else is on your plate usually when we talk to to people on your level there's a lot more <laughs> there's a lot more going on than, than just that yeah uh what else what else you got going uh well just started uh so i've been doing uh, i did a lot of marvel zombies comics i took it over from robert kirkman at marvel and, started, and i'm sort of continuing my super zombie run nice. with Di dynamite not to be confused with Jimmy Walker's catchphrase, it is in fact die D I E exclamation point Namite, which is the Dynamite Comics uh, zombie crossover. So you've got Red Sonia, Vampirella. The the sequel Dynamite Lives has got Ash Williams from Army of Darkness, nice. uh, Evil Ernie, and Smiley, <laughs> and Hell, not Lady Death. That's not a thing. We don't write to that. Nope. Uh, <laughs> Um, what I'm missing, uh, Deja Thoris and John Carter of Mars are in the first series, all this, the, the, uh, Peter Than Cannon Thunderbolt and all the Project Superheroes guys. So it's a, it, it's zombie mayhem, but with more pulp heroes and more humor and buckets of gore. Um, this, this sounds like something Tim Seeley would also be interested in participating in. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Tim is the big <laughs> chaos nut. So yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, I, I, I bet he would. Um, and, uh, and, and speaking of sort of grindhouse, um, pulp stuff also from dynamite, I'll be doing, I don't know if this is announced yet. So I don't know. it's about to be, yeah, it's about, it's about to, to be. be. I, I don't, <laughs> I cannot imagine that it's going to solicit for September. So it's going to be now shortly if it isn't already, uh, I'll be doing, I'm doing a new series of Jennifer blood, which is a great, uh, hmm. Punisher type character created by Garth Ennis. Uh, okay. that uh, will be coming back with a series called Blood, Jennifer Blood Bloodlines. And Jennifer Blood also appears in Dynamite Liz. Awesome. Today, so. Calling her cool. a female Punisher is is somewhat reductive, semi-accurate. Um, Maybe the Punisher is a female her. Well, male, you know, Je- Je- Jennifer Blood doesn't <laughs> a like male, a, fair, a male her. Unlike the Punisher many times, uh, Jennifer Blood really doesn't like a fair fight. She's more of a... Uh, She's more of a highly active serial killer who targets only. She's more of a Dexter, I would say, than a okay, Punisher. Okay. Okay. So not um, too far off from uh, from Punisher, but <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, she cool. she she would rather kill you before she would rather kill mobsters before they know she's after them. You know, I feel right. like a lot of times Punisher kicks in the door and sprays a room with bullets. That's right. He likes a good sh- right. he likes a good shootout. Yeah, yeah. 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 He, he's he's more in your he's much more in your face. Jennifer Blood is a bit more clever about it. I think I, I think I'm gonna like this chat for blood. Though, disturbing so. ways, yeah. but yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a fun series. Ladies, gentlemen, and envies, that is the end of our show. Thank you so much, Fred Van Lente, for joining us, and giving us a little bit of your time. My pleasure. Uh, we can't read, can't wait to read uh, the rest of the stuff that's coming out. What'd you say? You said uh, Jennifer Blood, Dynamite Lives, and of course, all the other titles that we will timestamp below in the description and the comic book history of animation. July twenty second. Yes. Or is it That's 20? awesome. I don't know. Whatever the two days. All right, everybody. <laughs> you have a good one 20. and stay safe. We're out of here. Peace. What's up, friendly neighborhood nerds? If you want to hear interviews from industry pros, get first looks, and have access to endless comic content, wake up. Please wake up. You're in a coma. Your mother misses you.